think that's going on, or do you have um, simply, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I have two thoughts on that. One is that um, you don't actually have to represent variation as variation per se. You just have to acknowledge that variation exists, and that that gets you off the ground <laughs> to thinking that selection might operate over a population of varying individuals, whatever those variations might be. The other thing is that um, people who have studied essentialism um, from a developmental point of view think that it's really categorization that gets people thinking in an essentialist way. That we know that infants um, are uh, highly ready to categorize um, uh, based on experiments where they're just looking at different stimuli and they appear to impose categories on those stimuli. Um, and, and you see categorization phenomena emerging very early in um, childhood and, and how kids play with their toys and talk about their toys and how parents talk about stuff. Like categories are oftentimes imposed on continuous kinds of phenomena, continuous kinds of data. So, um, you know, what in, a, in essence is basically is a, an assumption that all the members of a category share something in common. And you don't even have to know what that thing is, per se. Um, you just make the assumption that they do share something, and that's why they're in the same category. Just one quick follow-up. So it seems like statistical thinking then can either work for or against this. So you know, statistical thinking in terms of thinking about averages, means, medians, et cetera, is sort of you know a, a negative. But statistical thinking in terms of representing the variation as some sort of aggregate, like variation is this much or this little, um, can be helpful. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about um, the role of statistical thinking or whether you've measured anything having to do with statistical thinking here. No, I haven't, but that's actually a really great suggestion. Um, uh, as someone who's been trying to teach undergraduate statistics, I'm always re, um, uh, re-impressed by how little they they understand and can grasp the concept of variation. We'll go over activities showing that it's not just that the means that matter, it's, um, that the variation within a sample matters too. And it's really hard to convey that idea. Um, I don't know to what extent, I think that if you have very, a very good grasp of variation and, and how the means are just a, one of many representations of that variation, that could be useful. But I don't think it's, a, it's necessary. I think you could probably um, get away with a, a less quantitative, more qualitative appreciation of variation and, and start to uh, engage with evolutionary phenomena in the correct way. Um, yes? Um, it seems to me there's somewhat of a logic behind the essentialist explanations. It, it, just going back to, you know, sort of an EA point of view where not all traits you're tracking an organism, if you want to hunt it, if you want to be aware of it, whatever, not all traits are as equally likely to change. There's some things that are very low heritability, so it makes sense for us to kind of make generalizations based on those sort of low low heritable traits so that we can know how to predict you know animals' behavior uh, Sure. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't um, deny that. And it's probably a reason that essentialist thinking remains so common in folk biology. Um, People have looked at domain specificity when it comes to essentialism, and you find some essentialism around artifacts, like what makes a chair a chair is that the uh, creator intended it to be a chair. But the richness of the essentialist inductions, um, sort of, it, uh, the inductions are not as rich um, as they are within the domain of biology. So it's probably the domain itself is structured in a way that supports essentialist thinking. And I was just trying to point out that it supports. Essentialist thinking is useful when thinking about individual organisms and how you might interact with individuals. But when it comes to thinking about change over time, it's going to be problematic. Just, just a follow-up question. I was just um, wondering if you think there might be a difference if you ask people questions about a trait that has either no heritability or low heritability versus a trait that has high heritability, whether you see a difference in their acceptance of variation within the trait. Yeah, you probably would. I think that. Um, I mean, you'd find evidence of that in the data we've already collected if you did item effects, um, analyses for item effects. Uh, I think one reason why uh, adults, transformationist adults and children were more accepting of behavioral variability than anatomical variability is they think it's less genetically fixed, that a draft could choose to sleep lying down instead of standing on its feet, maybe. <laughs> 
Um, so I think there's probably other things constraining those judgments. Yes? I was wondering, <coughs> uh, building on sort of the domain specificity of essentialist thought, uh, I'm wondering if you think there might be domains of thought where people naturally don't think in essentialist fashion, um, and those domains, you know, metaphors from those domains might be leveraged to explain evolution? That's a good question. Uh, probably not. Um, I have to think more about it. But one of the things that Stephen Jay Gould was arguing in Full House is that population thinking is potentially useful in many different domains, but we don't do it. Um, that we revert to thinking about central tendencies. And that may be a byproduct of categorization. Um, it may be a byproduct of something else, which is just that how often do you engage with populations? It's probably a much more modern kind of situation to be thinking about evolution in the first place, but not just evolution, with whole populations of data or populations of um, uh, uh, computer algorithms or populations of um, viruses, things like that. Um, so we, nowadays, we do think about populations of individuals quite frequently, but it might be sort of um, be a consequence of a lot of education and industrialization. So this is a, a, an ill-formed intuition, um, but I have the suspicion that, that essentialism and teleological reasoning are linked. And that um, even people, so there are many supernatural belief systems. Some of them have um, supernatural agents creating organisms for human purposes. Others don't have any clear explanation for why the world is the way it is. But um, things seem to have sort of roles, right? That is, this is what the butterflies do, this is what the penguins do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, those roles are very much connected to, you know, a, an essentialist view of the species where um, the, the function that it performs in some ecology or the, the purpose that it has in the world whereby it benefits human beings um, is, is connected to a, an idea that the species is uniform. And, um, it strikes me that the transformationalist reasoning is entirely, I mean, it's, you're correct that it is entirely consistent with essentialism, but it's also consistent with teleology, right? They're, they're striving for some goal. The butterflies are positive, changing in the direction of some goal. And that there's, a, you know, whether overt or covert, there's an architect that they're striving towards that goal. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in, in, in trying to teach, I, I didn't, say successfully as it tried, um, trying to teach evolution um, you know, here at UCLA, one of the things that I, I, I've frequently utilized is um, uh, maladaptations and constraints on optimality and um, uh, trade-offs um, where you show imperfections that reveal that there can't be teleology. Right? Right. This is a badly thought out design because there are workarounds that had to be you know, um, uh, constructed in a kludge fashion along the way problems that then required other solutions and things like that. And that seems to get students thinking a little more than um, at least those students for whom the, the elementary features of empirical variation um, doesn't seem to make a gift, right? The, you know, this couldn't be, there couldn't be a design behind this because look at how badly designed this is. It seems to get them puzzled a little bit more. Right. Perhaps by challenging their um, ideological <coughs> Yeah. Um, my, my uh, initial reaction to that is um, the, the extent to which the organisms are, or the species are behaving teleologically really is um, environment specific in the students' views. Um, it took many iterations uh, of the assessment to get it right, and one thing that I had um, in there was questions that, that tried to probe this idea that um, uh, the organisms, they were all changing together, but they were also changing toward, to becoming more perfect. They, were, they really were moving up a um, uh, ladder. Because this is something that, in the evolution education literature, this is like the primary misconception that everyone points to. But it just doesn't seem to exist that 
that students understand that evolution is about adaptation to an environment. Um, they don't think that it, every species is just becoming more perfect. Um, but there's still a teleology there. There's still some mechanism that's driving the adaptation. And I think that's, that's right. It, it, it could be a very uh, useful teaching strategy to point out error, so to speak, in, in adaptation. Um, and potentially, it's another instrument for you in terms of measuring misunderstandings. So that you know, I've had the experience of, of you know giving people little mini lectures on things like maternal fetal conflict and 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 showing how you know this is not the perfect system that people imagine it to be and their conflicts of interest and, and, and things go awry and things like that. And have people say at the end of that, quite literally, well, if that doesn't make you believe in God, I don't know what would. Right? <laughs> it's a remarkable complexity, and it all ends up you know working. Right? Uh -huh. They've just missed the point because they've been, they've been clinging to that teleological view so ferociously that you know their ears have closed as it were to um, the, the, the things that are inconsistent with the teleological view. Yeah. So you could conceivably measure it the same way that you measure your transformations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like um, one of you know kind of going back to this question of the sort of statistical thinking and such, right? I think one of, the, one of the challenges is to see whether this, this dichotomy between variationism versus um, you know, the alternative <coughs> kind of replicates you know, some of the ideas that like you know, Danny Kahneman and Tversky sort of came up with in the sense of human beings systematically misinterpreting probability. Right? So human, you know, is is it really that people are making making mistakes about definition of evolution? Or is it that they're only making misinterpretations of probability, and those are sort of adding up to produce misinterpretations of, of uh, evolution? So I think it's kind of like, a, you know, like I could say, what is the probability if my mother is a librarian that I'm a bigger librarian? It's very small because there's so few librarians. Right? So it's kind of interesting to sort of think about in sort of your future future research to sort of capture some, some data on whether the, the teaching in evolution also leads to change, you know, changes in people's systematic understanding of basic probability questions as well as, you know, as evolution, because then you can sort of see if there's an interaction going on there, right? Because it's hard to tell whether, is it, is it the errors in probability that produce errors in understanding of evolution, or is it, at some level, perhaps, errors in understanding of evolution producing errors in probability? Right. I, mean, I think that those kinds of errors probably contribute to the problems, but I think still the the basic um, misconception is is one of um, at the level of the ontology of the species that the species is treated as a population of unique individuals in the case of variational theory, and it's treated as this homologous type, um, a typology in the case of transformational theory. And, uh, and, and you know, being confused about the probability of mutations, and um, it's interesting to see when you when you look at justifications for most of the closed-ended responses. I also ask for justifications, and it's interesting to see how people have tried to assimilate what they're learning into this transformational framework. So they talk about chance and randomness and probability, but in ways that just don't relate to the uh, original question. Um, like, uh, let's see, what's an example? Um, like, there are uh, a bunch of people who will um, give the right response for the uh, woodpecker question, that they'll say either it's going to have a longer beak or a shorter beak, um, and their response will be something like, uh, because um, random mutations happen, but over time, the woodpeckers will, will all evolve a longer beak or something. Or they'll say it's not it's not guaranteed, but it's probably more likely that they'll have a longer beak. Um, so they know something that, that the mutations are random and that the recombinations can't be predicted, but they still they haven't quite figured out how that coincides with this belief that there's some mechanism ensuring that offspring are going to be born more adapted than their parents were. Um, yes? Oh, um. So, from what I understand, you taught your you taught the students uh, uh, variationism in a sort of implicit way. You said here are the facts and here are the inferences, step by step, right? Mm -hmm. um, what if 
in addition to that, you also explicitly said something about um, variationism versus transformationism, and you know, evolution is not about the you know group selection of the species or the essence of the species. It's about differences between members of the species. Do you think that would? Um, do you think having it figured out implicitly, plus also stating it explicitly at some point, would improve the, um, the change? I think that would work for the meta-conceptual student who can stand back and think about their own conception of species. <laughs> but um, it, the, the students themselves don't use words like essence to describe species, right? Well, and I know what you mean. But it, even giving language to it, they might not necessarily map that language onto their own uh, thoughts and, and uh, concepts. I guess um, I was being too literal, but I was just wondering, did you ever state, you know, evolution, like direct, directly, evolution is about, you know, individual of the species, it's not about, um, you know, the whole species or something like that. I, I, I don't mean using words like transformationism, but something like more at that level. Yeah. Um, so something that, that's relevant to this is that uh, one way that students tend to learn, uh, this wasn't replicated in these data, Maybe it was, and I, I didn't do the right analysis. But in my the very first study I did, I found three groups of students, and it wasn't cross, it wasn't longitudinal. It was just a cross section. One was a group that hold, held strongly transformational views, another that held strongly variational views, and then this middle group that held transformational views on everything except for uh, adaptation and inheritance. And what what was happening with that group that I dubbed in the paper. Um, pre-variationists was that they had learned basically two principles. Um, one was that uh, acquired characters are not inherited, and that allowed them to answer a lot of the questions about inheritance correctly. And the other was that um, uh, selection of the survival of the fittest, and that helped them on the adaptation section. The thing is, they hadn't yet worked that into their understanding of evolution in general. They, they knew that organisms that weren't particularly adapted to the environment would be less likely to survive and reproduce, but they had no idea how that resulted in population change over time. Um, so I, I think there's, there's something that has to happen between making that, those kinds of realizations and working, working those inferences into a topic like speciation or extinction. Yes? Oh, this is... Um Actually, it's from, from Willem's question about possibly uh, domains in which people naturally uh, develop uh, variational rather than essentialist ways of thinking. And it seems like perhaps one is the way we think about human beings that we know personally. I mean, we have, a, we have folk theories of human nature, which we would apply to predicting the behavior of strangers. But, you know, if I'm going to predict Willem's behavior, I'm not going to think, how do, how do humans, or how do, how do human males, or how do, how do Dutchmen behave? <laughs> how does Willem behave? So, and I, I don't know how you can work that metaphor in helping people understand evolution, but that it does seem like a domain where people naturally are not essentialists. Great. Um, so there's actually a paper on this topic that um, it was uh, a study done by Nettle, and it came out in evolutionary psychology, where he took a lot of my tasks and reframe them in terms of humans. So all of my tasks are, the vehicles are um, animals of some sort. Um, and he just changed it to be about humans and found that that actually resulted in a higher overall test score. But everybody was still failing in the grand scheme of things. So everyone was still <laughs> re um, revealing transformational misconceptions. But when they were thinking about it in terms of humans, they were a little bit more likely to accept variation and thus um, you know, demonstrate a, a correct understanding. And what's particularly interesting about that, which Nettle rightly points out in the discussion, is that uh, it's humans where the, the, the big sticking point comes with um, acceptance of evolution. That a lot of people who will deny that humans evolved will accept that other non-human animals evolved. But, it, but it's humans are the, the species where the, we might be most um, sensitive to variation within that species and thus uh, could profit most from um, instruction about evolution. Yes? I'm curious how the concept of uh, genetic uh, diversity relates to variation. It seems intuitive to many people that uh, having a lot of genetic diversity is, is a good thing, especially in terms of breeding programs and whatnot. 
by having low genetic diversity, it's inbreeding, everybody knows that you're not supposed to mate with your siblings, that kind of thing. So um, how, do, how do people kind of put those two ideas together? Yeah, um, this is something I've talked to my collaborator, who's a biologist at UMass Boston about quite a bit, because um, uh, Quite frequently when we write together, she inserts genetic in various places, and I always take it out because I say, we don't actually talk about, uh, there's, you don't have to know anything about genes to be scored as a variationist on this survey. But you know, her feeling is that actually, you really do have to have the right genetic understanding to get some of these concepts, uh, maybe for particular questions. So clearly, they're, they're going to be helpful. Um, they're going to be mutually supportive, having a, a sound understanding of genetic phenomena and population level phenomena. I mean, that was the, the modern synthesis is really what got Darwin's views back into the, the limelight and it got biologists to take them seriously again because there was this time period where other views were sort of competing neck to neck with Darwinian views and where a lot of Lamarckian biologists um, working. So it's not something I've explored directly, but it's definitely something to look at in the future. Um, yes? I was just uh, puzzling through your findings and wondering if there are implications um, for understanding the cross-national variation and acceptance of evolution. And it seems to me like that may be determined by something else, but by, well, so you said that the authors of the paper had done some analyses that suggested that it had to do with certain religious beliefs. Okay. But is there is there some kind of a connection here between what you've documented and, and those beliefs that explains Right. Um, the cross-national so variation. I'm just wondering what's going on with the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> That's the bottom line. So the findings at the end would suggest that given that an understanding of evolution is connected to more acceptance, that in nations like Finland, more people would be under, would understand evolution. On the other hand, though, the, the second part where I was looking at essentialism, the, the thought there is that we're all essentials. Yeah, that right. we, and we, we're essentialists at, at the age of two, and that continues to constrain how we interpret biological phenomena. So I really should do some cross-cultural work to see whether or not that increased acceptance um, uh, uh, goes along with increased understanding, or if there really are different reasons for the, the acceptance there. Um, yes? Well, so you I think she had her hand up. OK. <laughs> yes? Oh, yeah, so I wonder, um, I think you've been going back and forth in terms of trying to explain it in terms of essentialism and some richer theory of what essentialism is and just categorization. Huh. And um, Louder, Christina. I wonder whether, for example, the need to uh, represent this as inherited from parents to offspring or as something internal um, actually is necessary for um, getting the kinds of deviations from variationist understanding that you're proposing. Is there something particular about essentialism that you want to claim is different from kind of categorization with an expectation of relatively high homogeneity within a category relative to non-category members? Yeah, so I was recently part of a group that uh, we, a bunch of uh, developmental psychologists, cognitive psychologists, science educators, biologists got together talk about the challenges of teaching and learning evolution. And there, the notion of essentialism really got brought up a lot and dissected, because um, there are some people who have been writing about essentialism as an obstacle to evolution understanding for a very different reason, which is that if you assume that um, the way an organism appears and behaves is determined by an essence that's fixed at birth, and that organism passes on its essence when it reproduces, then the essence should never change. That you know, that a tiger should basically remain the same from generation to generation to generation because the essence is being passed on faithfully from one generation to the next. So the thought was that essentialism there is constraining acceptance of macroevolution that's just even occurring at all. Whereas if you look in the, the literature on the history of evolutionary thought, when essentialism comes up, it's coming up for this reason about homogeneity versus heterogeneity, heterogeneity of members within a category. Um, I, for what I'm interested in, I think it's it's just that notion that's of most importance. It's about degree of variation within a population, and that's the real sticking point. Um, 
but you do find effects of the other kinds of essentialism on acceptance of macroevolution um, that say among children, if you are willing to accept that essences vary, and now I'm forgetting the task that's used to measure this, but then you're also more accepting of evolutionary change. Um, again, though, it's not clear that we're, we might be using the same label to refer to very different kinds of biases or, or, or beliefs. So I'm modified some of the questions that you used in this. Louder. Oh, I did. Um, I'm bothered by some of the questions that you used. So in the, in the woodpecker question, for example, um, it's quite possible that the offspring of the woodpecker would have long bills to be in different places. Um, it's true of humans, for example. They could have people with a given length of arms and legs and put them in a warmer climate, their kids have longer arms and legs. Um, and uh, that's a fact, actually. And uh, that's due to the fact that development has some plasticity in it. And so I'm quite sympathetic to, to the co op because, because when Darwin believed in the inheritance of part of the age, uh, he was a transformationalist and a population thinker simultaneously. Uh, and that's because he didn't understand the difference between, I mean, that we now say, phenotype and genotype, the vice mod would have said, you know, Solomon and, and, uh, and uh, the other one. But anyway, um, and, and your whole, you know, whole structure you're, you're built on assumes that variation is enough. But of course, variation isn't enough. It, it's, it, there's, the variation has to be heritable. You could have all the variation you want and have no evolution. <coughs> and um, so it, and so that question bothered me. And several of the questions you could have at the end, if you had the five questions you tested, I would have answered. And it seems to me you could have, you could be a transformationalist and believe that evolution occurs. Species are changed of time. You could be a transformationalist and believe speciation occurs. The mark should be. Right. Uh, you could be uh, a transformationalist and, or a kind of transformationalist, but you could be a non-Darwinian and think that new species arise and natural selection has nothing to do with it. Steve Wolf has argued that it's macro evolutionary. And of course, you could certainly believe that humans are, we could, you know, could be, that we have a different theory to explain us than other creatures. So it seems to me that. You know, it seems to me that you're focusing on variation without that really being the fundamental. Uh, you know, it's variation plus some other things that give us the, the modern view of variation, not just variation. Well, so the, the survey had a total of 30 questions mm -hmm. in, on it in its entirety. And so variation was only one sixth of the entire uh, survey. So I didn't go over other stuff. In, usually because when I'm talking about this, that's the, many of the people in my audience are confused about variation and its role in evolution. So that I, I really emphasize that with the moths on multiple slides and stuff like that. Um, so we're tapping into other components, um, the extent to which they think selection is the mechanism that's driving change, um, as opposed to some mechanism that operates over all individuals and populations. So there's a whole section of questions on that. Um, and also, when it comes to individual questions where you could, uh, maybe you're, you interpreted that <coughs> woodpecker question as meaning that uh, the woodpeckers, um, through phenotypic plasticity, will develop longer beaks. You know, the, the, I assume what you're talking about is the infant woodpeckers, as they're developing, will end up with longer beaks. Yeah. So if you measure them at the same point in the life cycle, I right. don't know. Birds I've shown in about the great development of plasticity of peak morphology of birds, but I do know, Robert Kirshan's other study, the development of plasticity of skeletal morphology of humans. Right. And there is some. But people right. develop, you know, sort of bird and animal tool. People do develop. So there's, there's adaptation of both kinds. There's genetic adaptation, but there's right. also the yeah. Well, we have one question that's more similar, which is that a pair of birds get blown to a different island that has a windier environment. They develop stronger wing muscles. Their offspring 
should develop, should have um, stronger wing muscles, weaker, weaker wing muscles are stronger or weaker. And the question is framed is at birth they will. But some people will say, well, they'll say stronger wing muscles and then they'll explain in their justification. Um, they'll develop stronger wing muscles just like their parents did. So the justification is a way to catch instances of uh, selecting what we term the wrong response from the right reason, or vice versa. I think more often we get people selecting the right response for the wrong reason, and we see it in the justification. So we try to uh, deal with these problems, first by having lots of different questions, and secondly by having justifications for pretty much all, maybe not all, but almost all of the closed-ended tasks. Um, okay. <laughs> I sort of a follow-up question to that, which is, you know, more and more um, work is out there about the role of epigenetics in shaping phenotypes, and um, I'm sort of wondering, you know, do you see viable ways of kind of updating the kinds of questions that you're asking or the ways that you're measuring things that would still allow you to get at the fundamental issues that you're interested in, but sort of take into account the biological reality of how gene expression can be shaped by environmental influences in a way that is actually sort of adaptive within the lifetime of the individual, but because of that sort of selective history of the ne necessity of the conditional responses. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've worked with biologists in, in creating this. Um, specifically because I was concerned about my own knowledge of biology. And what you have to remember is that before you can get to a point where you're understanding epigenetics, you have to first understand that selection operates over a population. So that when the, di the misconceptions we're diagnosing are not really sophisticated, if you had a sophisticated epigenetic view of evolution, we would see that in the way that you responded to the questions. And there's a lot of like really simple things that you you know, would get right and the person with the transformational view would get wrong. Um, so I, th I don't think the assessment would end up categorizing, say, a biologist as a transformational thinker. Um, but of course, we don't want to have questions on there where there's no correct answer from, you know, a modern biological point of view. And I think that there are actually a number of assessments out there that do end up um, with questions like that. Um, because you know you have, you walk a fine line when you're trying to both diagnose misconceptions but also provide a way of, of eliciting proper conceptions. Um, you don't want to create situations that are too artificial. <coughs> so I you know I hope that we balance it. But the whole assessment, by the way, is in the appendix of um, a 2006 paper that's posted on my website. So if you find me and then just find that paper, you can see the whole assessment for yourself and if you're interested in using parts of it and want to critique it. <laughs> yes? Uh, regarding the, the sort of um, country gap in terms of how our whole lives play out and, and the, the, the broad discrepancy between the U.S. statistics and, say, the independence, um, what are your thoughts on the educational process we engage in in our country? And, and the methods by which early childhood or, or, or even K through 12 educators can begin to, you know, illuminate the, the um, not just in, in evolutionary education, but in, in general, combating that sort of essentialist A is A um, reasoning that we're all born with. Uh, what, what, what have you gleaned from the success of your assessment and intervention method um, in terms of um, applying to a, to a younger age and maybe setting children up to be able to enter college with a, a much better ability to extract principles yeah. and then get to the right answers. Well, there's there's a move afoot in the evolution education community to teach evolution at younger and younger ages. And I wholeheartedly agree. I think the data in the second study really support the idea that the children have basically the same misconceptions that they will have as adults if they don't end up learning evolution. Um, uh, so there, it doesn't seem like there is any additional obstacles in teaching young children, elementary school age children, evolutionary concepts anymore. In fact, there's probably more obstacles in place in teaching a college student or a high school student evolution because they've had, say, 10 extra years to formulate um, beliefs in terms of an inappropriate vocabulary, thinking about species as a typology. And, 
and, and not as you know, a population of varying individuals. So um, there are studies being done right now um, trying to demonstrate the effectiveness of teaching children at a younger age. I don't know necessarily there's a particular way of teaching children that would be different than teaching adults. That would be more effective. Maybe that's true. Um, uh, but the, the way that evolution gets treated in textbooks, as I'm sure many of you know, it gets quarantined to like this one chapter so that anyone in the US could potentially buy the book and then if you don't want to teach evolution, you just want to teach that chapter. Whereas everything in the book should be contextualized in terms of evolution, and it should happen from a very early age. It should happen from in, in elementary school textbooks as well. If we really want to present them with our best understanding of biological phenomena. Yeah, I think, uh, as my host in Fiji always says, at the end of dinner, time's up. So. <laughs>